I stand here. Show them your face. Strong teeth, strong constitution, can still work a full day in the fields, has some domestic capabilities. I understand from her previous owner that she never gave him cause for concern. This slave is an obedient dog. Who will give me fifty dollars for the bidding starts now, for this woman is for sale. I see some of you are uncomfortable with this horror of one human being selling another. But my sister and I are here to tell you that this horror occurred daily in the streets of our southern cities. We were moved to not stop our protest until every man, woman, and child in chains was released from their bondage. That selling of me we used to do when we toured Massachusetts back in 1837, this being 1870 now, and we're looking back on our abolition days. So, But perhaps it might be helpful for you to know how two southern ladies came to be touring Massachusetts telling their story. It goes way back. Yes, and I will begin because I am the eldest. Yes, dear, you always have been. Now, <laughs> now dear, is this, shall we pull this back a little bit or over there? Perhaps we'll just bring it back just a bit because I'm afraid we're tethered here. I was born in 1792 in Charleston, South Carolina to an eminent family John Grimke and Mary Smith Grimke. My father had been fighting under George Washington in the War for Independence. And he was also a judge in the Supreme Court of South Carolina. We had 13 children in our family, 11 of whom were were came to grown upness. <laughs> Is that a word? Um, when I was past the nursemaid state, as each of us did, I got my own slave. I would was already did not like slaves, the idea of slaves, but I did like my own slave. Her name was Hetty. And she was a nice little girl. And I would help her do her work. You know, clean my house, clean my room, rather, and um, make my bed so that we could play together. We played together very much. She was, as I said, my best friend. And she was quick and she was smart. And I had a clever idea. I thought it was a clever idea that I was going to teach Hetty to read and write and that then she might be able to better herself. And so it was that at night, after we had turned down our lights, our lamps, and built up the fire, we flopped down on our stomachs in front of the fire, and we began to read. I had a lot of books, and I would teach her the, the, the letters, of course, and then I taught her short words, and then she was reading little books, you know, beginner books. She was reading. And I still get a malicious satisfaction thinking that there, in front of my fireplace, my little maid and I, we disputed, we defied the laws of the state of South Carolina. And my father had made, helped make that law about not teaching a slave to write. Well, one night, there we were, doing our reading. And all of a sudden, there was a knock at the door, and it opened very quickly. And it was my father. And when he saw what we were doing, his face filled with a rage. He stomped over to Hetty. He picked her up by the shoulders and he pushed her out the door and down the stairs and I knew there were whips at the bottom of the stairs and I called out Papa don't whip her please Papa 
she did not whip. He did not whip her, but he told her she could never be in my room again. And then he came up and he yelled at me so much the whole house heard it. And he said, I could never, I must never teach a slave to read or write. I will tell you something. I never took another slave. I refused to. But two years later, my Hetty took sick and died. And I've always felt guilty about that. So then I was alone, but, but I read a lot. And I loved my father's library and I loved his law books. I wanted to be a lawyer when I grew up. But then when my father heard that, he said, you cannot be a lawyer. You are a girl. But then he did say, if you had been a boy, you would have been in one of the finest mines, in finest legal mines, that is, in South Carolina. I've always thought, if God gave the same brain to man and woman, why would he think only one of them should use it? Well, then I was quite despairing. But my mother, you see, I was 13 years old now, and I could tell all of a sudden that my mother was with child. And when she was born, it was my Angelina. And I begged my mother to let me be the godmother. Oh, that's silly. She said, no, no, no. But I harassed my mother so much that finally she said, oh, all right. And when I stood in that church with my baby, with the, my baby's sister, I prayed to God that I might be a fit mother. Not just a godmother, you see, but a mother. And you have been, dear. In that my sister raised me as if she were my mother, you can imagine that my upbringing was quite different than the one she had experienced. <laughs> I never had a slave. And from the time I could first walk, I would follow my sister down to the slave cabins when they returned from the fields, and we would read the Bible to them in the evenings. And all the way walking back to the house, my sister lectured me about the evils of slavery. But I had eyes of my own. I could see what was happening around us. I remember when I, I was still quite a young girl walking home from market with my basket and I had to walk by the slave block and they were auctioning off this young woman whose baby had just been taken from her arms and sold to the highest bidder in the crowd. I, I felt paralyzed in my steps. I looked that girl in the eye and when she, she saw me pause, she started to plead with me to help her, saying, please, missus, please get my baby back. But there was nothing I could do to change the circumstance. There was nothing I could say. And I had to turn my back on that girl and just walk away as if what was happening was of no circumstance to me. In those days, I was still fortunate in that my sister was there for me to return to, to cry with, to, to be angry with. But she was not always to be there, for by the time I was 13, she had left our home. You see, our father became very ill, and it was decided that he should go north for better doctrine. And he decided that it was I that would attend him as he went on his on his journey, so I did. And we went to north to Philadelphia. We found a boarding house that was Quaker. And in fact, we found a doctor who was Quaker. And he went to this doctor for two months, but it was of no use. My father waned away and he died. And then I, I could not return to South Carolina. I stayed in Philadelphia and I began to attend Quaker meetings, which gave me solace and peace. That's what Those I was Those years were not easy for me being back in the care of our own mother who did not know what to do with me either. 
Our brother Henry had taken over the estate from our father, and I must admit he was at times not kind to the slaves. In the evening, I would sit in parlor with my brothers and sisters, and I would say to them when they asked their slave to pour their tea or hand them their book, isn't that something you can do for yourselves? And they would look at me as if I was from some foreign country. Well, one night, Henry was complaining about his slave, John, and I became afeard for John. And I said, Henry, you're not planning on whipping John over this matter, are you? And Henry said, Angelina, tomorrow I plan on whipping John within an inch of his life. But, but Henry, you wouldn't treat your horse that way. And he said, Angelina, my horse wouldn't have done what John did. And I knew then I could no longer live under the same roof with my own brother. And I soon found a ship that was heading north. And at 19, I, I went to Philadelphia to join my sister and to try and become a good Quaker. Oh, well, I was busy trying to be a good yes, Quaker, you were. Too. Although it was not easy. They did not make it easy for no, us, did I, they, I, dear? But I was wearing my bonnet. Yes. And I was wearing my plain clothes. And I noticed that the colored people were allowed to come to the meeting, the free coloreds. Yes. But then I also realized that they had to sit at a bench at the back of the meeting. So when I got up the gumption, I went and I sat with them. It was not the first time my sister made someone uncomfortable. Well, you see, they had very many rules in our Quaker meeting. Rules meet. that we could yes, not abide we by. Could, we could only read Quaker publications. And, of course, my sister had started to attend anti-slavery meetings. I was so delighted to be in a place where there were some like minds. But when I learned that Mr. William Lloyd Garrison was publishing The Liberator, I had to read it. Yes. In fact, that's what led to the letter. I what? guess we should oh. tell them about the letter. I, you know, I really wish she had asked uh, me about this letter. Let me tell them what happened, really, because there's yes. more to the Why story. Why did you do that? I wasn't even with her at the time, so I didn't know anything it. was about the it. summer of... So 1835, and my sister yes. and I were living with different families that summer. And when I read in the Liberator that Mr. Garrison, who was preaching this new idea, not recolonization of sending the slaves back to Africa, but immediate emancipation to welcome our colored brothers and sisters as equal citizens with all the privileges and rights that we have. Yes, well, that... And then, well, then I learned that Mr. Garrison had been bound and, and dragged behind a horse through the streets of Boston for his ideas, and, and I became afraid for him. But mostly I became afraid he would stop preaching his ideas. It isn't that I disagreed with her about this, oh, my dear. but I feared for her safety. Well, I just see? wrote a letter, but, and it was not between you and me. It was between my Lord and me. I but prayed I for am three in days. Charge of you. But my Lord is my witness. And after three days, I knew I could not live with myself if I didn't send the letter to Mr. Garrison. But my dear, I did not Please. think he would publish my letter in the Liberator. I did not see that. Well, he did. Well, even if I thought he might publish my letter, I didn't think he'd sign my name to the letter. Well, why wouldn't he sign because your I'm name? Because I'm a woman I mean, and a woman has a, never been published a in a newspaper. Southern, a southern woman. Oh, well, that was the perfect thing for him to do. He did publish the letter and my name and unfortunately my elder sister learned about it through the elders in the meeting and she was not pleased. I am her mother. Now, I was prepared for the anger of the elders, but when my own sister, who taught me everything I know about what's right from what's wrong, who has seen what I have seen and feels what I feel for you, for you to ask me to recant my beliefs publicly, I have never suffered so, and I refused to ever go back to Quaker meeting. I would oh. not step my foot in there again. Angelina. My sister I continued to be a so good Quaker. I'm so sorry. I'm so then sorry. Then Mr. Garrison invited me to come to New York City, but 
we yes. decided to stay in Philadelphia. Yes, but we, then, then he asked her again to come to New York well, City. Well, he first asked I me didn't. to write another letter, Mr. Garrison did, and this <laughs> time I asked nobody I knew I needed to, and I wrote a 40-page letter addressed to the Christian women of the South, which in fact was burned in the streets of Charleston. And, and that's when our mother wrote a letter. We could never go back. We could never go back to Charleston. We would have been <coughs> killed. We would have been burned in the streets oh, of Charleston. Burned, maybe worse. So, but then again, she got invited to New York City. A year later, and, yes. And this time and I was asking no permission of anyone. Well, and I decided no, but to go. you, d wait. Just listen to me. I, I decided that it would be a good thing to go to, to New York City. I decided that a new door was opening for us. Oh, Mr. Garrison right. was inviting 80 agents to be trained in the art of public speaking that they might begin to abolitionize our nation. Yes, well. We had two mm -hmm. teachers. Mr. Theodore Weld, who himself had abolitionized the state of Ohio, and the most eloquent Mr. John Greenleaf Whittier. Yes, well, and also uh, William Lloyd Garrison. Of course, Mr. Garrison. And we were the only women who were among the speakers. It was that such were a being privilege trained. to be there amongst oh, we were so these happy. spirited, For the first time, we were so happy. <laughs> It was probably the happiest time in our lives. Yes. Dear. Yes, and so after three or four weeks, we began to go out to sewing circles. Women, all to women. Speak to the women. The that so was our, and our mission. And but these grew, and so it after did. a while, we we would go to the church parlor instead of the home parlor. And the minister, of course, would introduce yes. us, but then leave so that it would not be a promiscuous setting. You see. Gentlemen were not to sit in rooms to listen to women speak publicly. It was, it in was fact, unnatural. women weren't supposed to speak publicly at of all. Not by the and way, we abided by that in so, the beginning. So then, what happened was one night it or was one January day, January of 1837. This yes. is important now. And all of a sudden, one day, a man introduced us to the audience and. Then he went to the back of the room and, and he stayed. stayed in the room, and we didn't know what to do. But of course, we must speak. Go so speak. we just shared oh. our stories of yes. our experience. But then afterwards, we went straight to Mr. Weld, and we said, "What should we have done?" And yes. his his response quite amazed us because he was delighted. He said, if our husbands, brothers, fathers, sons are to represent us when it comes time to vote, they need to hear what you think and, and believe. Yes, that's right. So, from that time on, now, we welcomed gentlemen to come into our yes, audiences. a promiscuous audience, just like this one. Yes, yes.